Hello, Collateral Gaming listeners. Chazzle Dazzle here from the Trial by Air Variety Show podcast. I just wanted to take a few seconds to invite you guys over to what we do. No, it's not video games, but we do invite really awesome and unique bands from all over the world. We dig deep into their souls and find really cool stories to tell you, and there's tons of music every week, so subscribe to us wherever you subscribe to your podcast. We look forward to having you. This episode of Collateral Gaming bonus round we're focusing on the assassin's creed franchise as we dive into our top five favorite assassin's creed settings followed by a mini review on assassin's creed brotherhood a uh, quick note also we uh the my virtual audio cable software is not compatible with my uh, i'm running on a beta of mac os big sur so we actually just straight up took the Skype recording. So the audio is not as good as it normally is, but I assure you the content will still be up to standard. So don't go anywhere. The show starts right now. Welcome to Collateral Gaming Bonus Round. I'm Ashley Chancellor. And I'm Zachary Gio. And we are podcasting straight from somewhere in South Texas and... Somewhere in South Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes, my friends, we are a 420-friendly podcast, so whatever you have, smoke it if you've got it, my friends. Uh, today... We are going to be talking about Assassin's Creed. This is an Assassin's Creed themed bonus round episode. We're going to kill it. <laughs> We're going to kill it, yeah. I mean, we just uh, I just recorded not too long ago, and I have the first part out as of the time of this recording, our uh, Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, which is the season finale um, for season two of Collateral Gaming. So I just kind of wanted to throw something in. Zach hadn't played Black Flag, so I said, but you know, he had played like two in Brotherhood, and I was like, hell yeah, man, I'd love to get back into um and back into brotherhood and you know we can just we'll just time this along with the release and then you know you and i can talk about it but if you haven't checked out the black flag episode dakota and i um were on that one and and we had a fun there too good i'm glad it was enjoyable i'm, I'm kind of sorry that i missed it but i will hold true to this i'm not sorry that i didn't play the game i will probably eventually give it a shot again but for some reason that game just didn't stick out too far for me to me sorry so Whoever's listening, please don't hate me because I have a lot of friends that absolutely love that game, Ash included. <laughs> I'm like uh, I'm like the uh, Omega Metroid podcast and their hatred for other M. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, other M is hated by a lot of people, so that's fair. Black Flag is kind of a weird one to, to die. That's weird to die on that hill. It's it's one of the more beloved entries of the franchise, but it is quite a bit different from the entries that preceded it. So I guess I can understand that perspective. Yeah, at um, that time, I think when Black Flag came out, I think I was more interested in consistency, and it definitely changed up the playbook, and it was a different, more rogue experience. And honestly, uh, at the time the game came out, I was not a huge fan of like sailing the seas and like pirates and all that stuff, even though I'm a huge Pirates of the Caribbean fan. But please don't judge me. Um, <laughs> yeah, just I'll probably give it another shot because I have a lot more time to do that nowadays. And so uh, and I'm older, wiser, smarter. <laughs> it's I more mean, of a pirate game than an assassin game. That was that was, uh, you know, kind of a point that we had brought up. Um you know what? I've never been a cowboy person, and I loved Red Dead Redemption 2, so that made <laughs> me actually like cowboys. I, I was playing some, uh, uh, what was it, Old Town Road while I was while I was playing the game. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Sasuke's theme that's kind of like Western sounding from Shippuden. <laughs> well, uh, Red Dead 2, I'm in the kind of in the same boat. I'm not a huge fan of like Wild West stuff, but Red Dead 2 was a really good experience, and the multiplayer 
was killer. I loved the multiplayer. I'm a huge fan of solid multiplayer, and they did a good job. God damn, it is a it is a wonderful game. But it I is. guess let's not bullshit too much longer. Uh, let's go with your number five of uh, top five favorite Assassin's Creed settings. Okay, so I'll be brief with my locations and their descriptions, but my number five is probably London from Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Um, London, England has always been beautiful to me, and they really did not leave out any details with the way they designed the city. It was absolutely beautiful, and, I mean, during the height of the British Empire, London, England was considered the most important city in the world. And so with the amount of detail that they put into it, I was just stunned, you know? I It wasn't my favorite Assassin's Creed game, but they got the location right, and, I mean... When you're when you're scaling around London, I mean, from the high, you can go to the top points of some of the most historic places like Big Big Ben, St. Paul's Cathedral, or Nelson's Column. You can see the entire city, and it's absolutely beautiful. I I think one of my favorite things about Assassin's Creed is reaching the high viewpoints and being able to overlook the city. And Syndicate did this right. Now, it's not the only game to do this right, but it stuck out to me when I was first thinking about this. Like I was like, damn, this is beautiful. And so that's why it's my number five. Um, I love London, and that's why it's on my list. Hell yeah. No, I loved playing in Victorian London as well. I mean, Assassin's Creed Syndicate setting uh, would have almost made my list. Definitely would have been an honorable mention for me because, um, like you, I, I really enjoyed the setting. I liked getting to see all of the uh, different landmarks in England. I like the fact that it's a little steampunkish. Um, oh, yeah. And it's definitely the most technologically advanced. It is the last game, chrono, you know, chronologically speaking, as, as long as, as when we're talking about the historical setting. Yeah. Um. So you know, I love the uh, the fucking grappling hook and being able to maneuver around the city and, and driving the carriages through. Mm -hmm. Um. And and also, you know, with that very Assassin's Creed uh, aspect that's in a lot of the games, taking back the city like one borough or district at a time was cool. Yeah. Um, and it then had the a gangs. It had an almost, uh, honestly, Brotherhood's my favorite Assassin's Creed, and we'll get into that later, but it had a very, very Brotherhood vibe to it with how you were slowly taking back every location with almost what felt like one kill or one mission at a time. And I, I loved that because it, it feels like you're climbing a very, very long ladder, and there are some points in the game where you feel like you're just not going to make it, but when you do, it's very rewarding. And Syndicate does that very well. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed the setting quite a bit. I liked um, kind of uh, moving across the River Thames. Um, I love the train. I love the um, I love the gangs um, and and even like some of the murder mysteries in it, which they took from from Syndicate. I mean from Unity. Um, but they go into you know more detail with uh, Syndicate um, and even the Jack the Ripper DLC is is, is really fun. Um, oh, my. Yeah. My number five is actually going to be Ancient Egypt, uh, the Ptolemaic mm. period from uh, Assassin's Creed Origins. Um, now, what I love about this in particular was just how many different uh, you know, landmarks are in the game. I think that there's just nothing that quite perfectly feels... You know, in the Assassin's Creed series, like climbing the Great Pyramids, you know, particularly the Pyramid of Khufu, and just kind of seeing the whole scenery, uh, being able to delve into the Sphinx. So there was just something that was really magical about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with, I mean, with where the PS4 was at, uh, and the Xbox One, sorry. <laughs> PS4 guys over here. But with where uh, graphics and the way game design worked when the game came out, they just really fully captured and immersed players into the world of ancient Egypt and honestly being able to see the golden sand just as far as the eye could see depending on where you were at and what Ash you were talking about climbing the great pyramid of Khufu and you can see everything from up there like I, I will not be able to stress enough how much I love being able to look out and just basically in these games unless there's like a very very established barrier you can basically go wherever you're looking. It's 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 kind of one of the things that made, I know this isn't a Nintendo episode, but it's kind of one of the things that made Breath of the Wild such a spectacular game. Because basically wherever you can spot, you can go there and check it out. And in Origins, it was spectacular. It was yeah. absolutely gorgeous. And I mean, Khufu, I, I, okay, I was doing a little bit of research 
And I mean, Khufu stands at about 455 feet tall and it takes a minute to get up there. And I mean, of course, before the, the golden capstone gets taken, yeah, the, the biggest parts of what you can see, you can see the other two pyramids as well as the great Sphinx. And there are parts in the games where you get to go and explore them. But just, I sat there for probably five or 10 minutes, just taking in the beauty yeah. of everything that I could see. And I didn't want to leave. And Origins was a really fun game to me because they changed the combat a little bit. It was a little bit more difficult. Um, you had to really time your parries and stuff like that, but that's for a different conversation. It was just, it made for a really surreal Assassin's Creed experience. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, like you said, I mean, uh, I like how even back then, the, the Great Pyramids were old as shit. I mean, we <laughs> think about them as old, but we don't understand. Uh, the Great Pyramids, I believe, are the oldest of, and, and the only one that's like still completely intact, I believe, um, of the original Seven Wonders of the World. So uh, the Great... But yeah, even back then, I mean, it, it, it's hard to put it in perspective because we think that, you know, what are they like? How old are they again? Several thousand years. Oh, yeah. Uh, I uh, think... Yeah, we're gonna have to look that up because I'm gonna not have to do research. I'm not, I'm not smart enough to think about that on my own. Um. Okay. It was built um, anytime between 2580 to 2560 BC. So think almost 3,000 years before Christ. Okay. All right. Add to that, we're 2,000 years. So that was about 5,000 years ago, right? Or give or take, right? Okay. I was alive then. <laughs> now. Assassin's Creed, like the, the origins takes place during the Ptolemaic period. Um, let me, and ju just for just for reference here, we're going to go off a little bit, but um, that was in, in 30 BC, okay? Uh, from 305 BC to 30 BC. And then uh, Assassin's Creed origins takes place around the, the latter end of it, I believe, towards okay. 30 BC, right? So we're talking about this, that, that took place about 2,000 years ago, okay? Yeah. The Great Pyramids were built 3,000 years before that. So they were still old as shit back then, too. <laughs> it was still a wonder of the world to them. You know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah. Just, just put that in perspective. We think, oh, man, that was a long time ago. But that was a long time ago for them, too. <laughs> yeah, that's another, and that's another thing, you know. Nowadays, when we think about the Great Pyramids of Giza and just all the history and culture that comes from ancient Egypt, they were still reflecting on that back then. Especially during this game, and you see that with the story of how this game takes place. There's a lot of historical references and a lot of spots where you can like look at and decipher hieroglyphics. And I, it's just it blows my mind. It absolutely blows my mind because imagine with how much history we have now. Of course, there's less history back then, but there's still enough to make a story in and of itself for the care. I guess if you well, kind of brought them to real life, you could have the characters tell their children those stories, but origins does have like an interactive mode, like an exploration mode that they yeah. added as DLC later where there's no story. It's just exploring Egypt in a historical context. Odyssey did the same thing, I believe. Um, and at the time origins was, I believe the biggest map of the Assassin's Creed series so far. And if you, if you look for instance, like at the at the location of the of the pyramids of Giza and the Sphinx, it was it was pretty accurate. Um, I like how robust the setting is too, because you would think it's all just desert, and you know, besides the pyramids, how many things could you possibly climb in it? But and and I will give it that there's a lot of desert and there's a lot of sparsity, but then you go to places like the city of Alexandria, um, mm -hmm. which is its own metropolis, um, and I believe I can't quite remember, but I do believe they feature the the fire in Alexandria, or at least it's referenced in the game. Mm -hmm. um, so there's actually kind of a historical reason for that. That was I think there's a mystery because every all the Library of Alexandria, like all that doc, all that uh, all those historical documents are lost to us. That's why there's so little we know about history from back then. It's because yeah. we don't have those written records anymore. <laughs> yeah, and I mean you can't really hope to make a game like that without including as much historical references as possible because. What what beauty that com the main beauty that comes from Assassin's Creed is having its own personal spin to historical events that have really happened. Like you and I were talking yeah. before the call about Assassin's Creed three and how it's not really that great of a setting. But with how many events that you're involved involved in, it's kind of crazy because the game is based off of you playing as an assassin. So technically, nobody even really knows you were there. And yeah, so I it's not. <laughs> 
I love how all the like in, in the Assassin's Creed series, most of your major assassination targets are people, real people that really died then. But Assassin's Creed provides a context for that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, this, this is actually the way that they died. An assassin killed them, you know? <laughs> yep. And, and that Great. was something that even the very first game did, is all the historical targets are all real people that died around that time. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that that's amazing. Um, but we'll have a, a lot more to talk about that in particular. Let's move on to our, um, our number four. Well, um, uh, my number four, um, I think you and I share one of the ones that's on my list, but, or multiple, but yeah, my number do. four is Paris from Assassin's Creed Unity or, you know, Europe and that, that, yeah, we'll just, we'll just go with Paris <laughs> because, okay. Ever since I was a little kid, Paris has been one of my favorite locations. It's one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And I mean, 300 years ago, it, it's no less beautiful. I mean, even though the Eiffel Tower its most famous monument wasn't there, but in unity's depiction of the game, there's still no shortage of culture and history. I mean, you can see the Notre Dame, the Notre Dame cathedral, and it's the tallest landmark around. Um, I mean, it's in the middle of, you know, the French revolution as chaotic and violent as that is, but it doesn't mean it loses any of the charm. I mean, when the game, because unity had a lot of issues with the way it ran sometimes, especially for me, Mm -hmm. but when the game runs beautifully or when it, when the game runs properly, it is stunning. And I mean, you can see that Paris in and of itself is a living, breathing city. I mean, you can, yes. vi- you can visit the Louvre where the Mona Lisa is kept. And uh, you can also visit the palace of Versailles that's nearby. And it's just, there's so much you can do. And oh my goodness, I absolutely loved unity. I didn't get to finish it though, but I, I do finished it either. I do absolutely love paris and that's why it's on my list because in real life one of my dreams is to visit france someday and when i <laughs> when i'm finally able to go there i'm like oh i remember seeing this in assassin's creed this is awesome i finally get to be here <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, my number four is also the same paris during the french revolution in assassin's creed unity um and let me tell you why i made my list okay when I was starting to think about, you know, and, and as far as Unity goes, I mean, we're, there's a lot of complaints about the bugginess, but I really think that there's a great game in there that that can shine through if you're willing to work through it. But one of the things that really hyped me up for it um, was the idea that Paris was a one-to-one recreation. And this was the first Assassin's Creed game to do that. And I, I think at the time, it may have been the biggest map, or I could be mistaken. Black Flag's map may have still been bigger. It held that that honor for a long time. But... Um, yeah. But yeah, and it's just one city, okay? Like Brotherhood just features just Rome, but it's big as shit. Um, and and there's just and the other thing that it did was the crowds. No other game had ever done this before, where you had as many people living in Paris as would have been realistic. You know, yep. you actually have these huge bustling crowds of people, and shit is always happening in the game. It's amazing. Um, and you there, there's different factions. Sneaky. Yes. The social stealth really shines through. Um, and I loved how um, the black box style that uh, Assassin's Creed Unity brought to a lot of the assassination missions, which hadn't been seen before since the very first Assassin's Creed. It's one of the few things that I really, really like about the first game and about Unity is this is this the way that they approach missions. And I know that's kind of getting away from the setting, but the reason why I like it is because um, it you can incorporate a lot of the social stealth and, and the crowds of it. And then also unity was one of the games to kind of bring back the idea of huge towering, uh, skyscrapers, something that had been, you know, kind of missing from Assassin's Creed three and Assassin's Creed four. Cause those locations weren't nearly as big. Um, but you do yeah, get to climb flat. They're a lot more flat because historically they just were. And, and I like that, that Ubisoft was willing to kind of push the series and, and adapt to different settings, but bringing it back to form with Assassin's Creed Unity with the huge landscapes and the beautiful French architecture. I mean, it is, there is no compare and you get to climb the fucking Notre Dame cathedral. You get to, <laughs> you know, like what other game lets you do that? <laughs> I mean, the, the game doesn't provide limitations. I mean, like you said, it's a one-to-one recreation. You're standing in Paris, France, for that time, for that period of time. And wherever you can go, you can go. Like, if you can see it, you can go there. And the first time I laid eyes on the Notre Dame Cathedral in the Palace of Versailles, my first thought was, 
I'm I'm gonna climb that shit. It's it's gonna happen. I'm gonna go to the top. I'm gonna scan. Because I like Assassin's Creed something, I said this earlier, but something Assassin's Creed does so well is viewpoints. It provides a very good outlook as well as a checkpoint to make sure that you visited that area. It's something that a lot of these types of games do very well. Um, and it, there's just no shortage of exciting moments. Now, Unity wasn't exactly the most solid Assassin's Creed game, but it's one of the most beautiful. Yeah, in the, the yeah, still to this day, I think a lot of the graphics are just really good looking. So even compared to Origins and Odyssey, I think that in some ways uh, Unity has better graphics. Um, I mean, the different uh, costumes on Arno just look beautiful, mm -hmm. um, and the vibrant colors. Uh, it's a shame that they'd gotten rid of some of the different aspects of the series that, that had come. Like, they got, they got rid of some weird things like whistling and being able to pick up weapons. But um, in a lot I, of ways, they did bring the, the game back to form. I also like how they encouraged the player to actually climb up on the rooftops like you're supposed to. One of the best things about Assassin's Creed was being able to get up on the rooftops. But you have fucking rooftop guards that are telling you to get down. And then over time, it just becomes easier to just kind of be on the ground like a citizen. And you kind of once that novelty wears off, you don't want to do it anymore. But yep. Unity kind of brought that back. And Syndicate does, too, by introducing you know the grappling shit. But I like how one aspect of Unity that was new to the series was not only did they remove rooftop guards because that's bullshit. We want to be able to climb roofs. But they also <laughs> added this aspect. I remember them, uh, you know, hyping it up beforehand where not just if you were on a, a synchronization point or a viewpoint, but also if you were just on rooftops, you would start seeing objectives laid out below you. So it really encouraged the player to do that and to be on rooftops like an assassin. What were you going to say, bro? Um, I was going to say uh, I'm with you on being against some of the stuff they removed from the game, but I actually didn't have a problem with not being able to pick up weapons because that provided a greater challenge for me now granted i'm not the most talented gamer in the world but i like relying on my gadgets and my personal skills because if i can't do a specific area yet i'm not going to beat myself over the head trying to do it over and over and over i'm going to try to get stronger learn some more gear or learn some more gear earn some more gear learn some more skills and just try to improve and come back so i wasn't as against that but that's that's basically all it was I wasn't really against it either because I'll be honest, I didn't really use the other weapons. It was just boggling to me why they <laughs> removed a feature. But, you know, maybe there was a reason for that. I do know that in, in, in Unity, you can instantly swap your weapons at any time in the pause menu. So it, it really doesn't matter. There already are so many weapons to choose from. Um, another gameplay mechanic that I think really complemented the setting really well, and it was a great um, addition to the franchise, something Unity did really well, was adding the ability to both free run up and down. Um now, previously in Assassin's Creed games, you could only climb up, and you would do that by holding the right trigger and holding down the jump button. And then they simplified it in um, 3 and 4 and Rogue by just allowing you to just hold down the trigger to keep free running, which was good. But what we were still missing was just the idea of, um, of having more control, and Unity gave you that. Again, you still had to continue holding down buttons to climb, but giving you the freedom to, to either um, cause you could hold down the right trigger just to move straight across a gap or you could, or you could hold down the jump button to do a higher jump or ascend and climb something, or you could hold down the, uh, the move down button, the circle button on the PlayStation to, um, to, to move down. And I liked how they relied less on the random bales of hay because you could free run down from any building. That was something that was sorely missing from the series. And even though you, uh, Origins and Unity kind of completely, um, uh, what's the word, completely revamped the, the climbing system and removed you having to use the right trick or doll, they did keep in effect the, um, the, the free running up and down. Um, in fact, I think Origins and Odyssey kind of just basically said, why do we have to hold down the right trigger button while we're doing this? Why can't we just have players just press X and, and press circle? I mean, that just and I'm kind of like, actually, yeah, why do we have to hold down the trigger? It's simpler. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a new way of doing it, and it's a lot simpler, in my opinion, and it works. You know, I have no complaints about it. Yeah, but yeah, I just love the fact that you could parkour up and down. Um, and that, that was one that we had in common there. We have a few more, but we may be hearing these differently um but what's your number three bro okay so for number three um i played this one a little bit but i noticed just how gorgeous the location was and honestly uh having family heritage in louisiana i couldn't say no to including assassin's creed 3 
Liberation on my list. Now, this location debuted in the PS Vita title, and it was brought to consoles finally in the Americas collection. But, I mean, Louisiana is just a beautiful place. Like, the... The the Louisiana Bayou and the Mississippi Ripper River Ripper the, <laughs> the Mississippi River is some of the more some of more dynamic environments than basically any of the games preceding it. Now I know the games had graphical limitations being on the PlayStation Vita, but it wasn't it wasn't terrible. And one thing I really enjoyed was playing as Aveline. She was an incredible mm-hmm. assassin, and honestly, I really liked the idea of playing as a female character. And I mean, you start the game traveling from the north of 18th century America, and you first encounter the Conor inhabit, and you move all the way to the swampland of Spanish-controlled Louisiana, and there's just no shortage of beauty that you can view. Um, I mean, moving through from city, uh, moving through the city um, as Aveline and assassinating key Templars to win back the city's freedom, it's just incredible, and I I really enjoyed what time I got with this game, however little it was. But I just had to include it because I I really loved and I thought the just the view of it was spectacular. Excuse my stutters. <laughs> <laughs> I have to agree with you. I haven't played very much of Liberation, but I finally got the chance to do it because I never had a Vita. Um, but I finally got the chance to to sit down with it. Um, whenever we did uh, the Assassin's Creed Four Black Flag episode, I bought the the Rogue Collection on. Um, yeah, I think it's called either that or the Rebel Collection. I don't, I don't can't remember. On the Nintendo Switch, which had both Rogue and Black Flag, and also included the Freedom Cry DLC. No, I'm sorry. I take that back. It's not part of that collection. No, it's part of the Assassin's Creed 3 Remastered Collection. I bought that around the same time, so excuse me for mixing that up. Um, the Assassin's Creed 3 Remastered Collection that came to... Um, the, the, I have a Nintendo Switch, and I also got free with uh, on the PS4 after uh, getting the Ultimate Edition of Odyssey. Um, came with Assassin's Creed Liberation HD, which is the HD remake of, of the game. So I finally got a chance to actually enjoy the game. Um, and the graphics, you know, you can tell that they're not as good. But um, in the HD version, they definitely look a lot better. Yeah. And I love a lot of the different um, gameplay aspects that were added to the game. Um, but we're not here to talk about that so much. Really, the setting. Um, as someone whose family used to go to New Orleans once a year, this was actually kind of just our, our thing. Every year we used to go on vacation. Heck yeah. um, I enjoyed the New Orleans setting, uh, as well as the the Louisiana Bayou. Um, it uh, was a lot of fun going down familiar areas. Um, I will say... I think that Red Dead 2 did it better with San Denis. Even, even though it's a fictionalized did. version, <laughs> yes. it, it, it's just a perfect recreation. <laughs> and some of the locations are actually actually completely accurate to the way that New Orleans looks and feels. They really capture the spirit. But that's neither here nor there. We're talking about the way that Assassin's Creed did it. And I'm still just as impressed. <laughs> I'm okay, not as impressed, but it, it was a limited title. Um, and, I, and I did enjoy being able to traverse the city in all three of the, what did they call them? Personas. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have to agree with you there. Although I've had very little, um, uh, very little with it. Uh, my number three is actually going to tie in here because my number three is from Assassin's Creed three. And that is the 13 colonies during the American revolution. Um, again, something that was, I think quite a bit hyped up before or coming out. Um, and I will say, and we mentioned you mentioned this earlier because of you know what I was talking about before, but the the frontier setting is kind of bland and uninteresting. But the reason I like this setting so much is the historical context, okay? And yeah, this game is a little bit more flat and sparse, but the historical context, being able to be a part of important events like the Boston Tea Party, Paul Revere's ride, major battles during the American Revolution, was awesome. And that's a feeling that you can't take away from me, being able to be a part of something that was ingrained. You know, we play through Assassin's Creed, and a lot of the history is cool. You're like, kind of, I know what's going on here. But every American, you know, all our American listeners will agree with me here, really in-depth got an education on the American Revolution. I mean, it was basically indoctrinated into us. Yep. And, and so being able to be a part of these events that we actually were extremely familiar with was really, really cool. Um, and Connor actually is is kind of interesting as a character. I don't mind him. I don't I don't um, agree with a lot of the criticism. He's all right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's all right. 
he's definitely not as he doesn't stick out as much to me as you know Altair or Ezio. But because Ezio Aldatore will always and forever be my favorite. Ezio will always be the best. There's no, I mean, there's they haven't beat it yet. Um, actually, going kind of rolling back a little bit, I wanted to make a point too because you mentioned Aveline being a female character. Yeah. I, I feel like that's something the Assassin's Creed series is sorely missing. I mean, Evie Fry was just kind of tacked into Syndicate, and it's obvious that the game was built up around Jacob, but then Dube 2 um, pushed back. They ended up adding Evie in later. Um, Aya's role was reduced in Assassin's Creed Origins. I think she originally was going to be the main character, and then they thought someone at Ubisoft... This, this is all hearsay, but somebody apparently somebody at Ubisoft thought, no, uh, people aren't ready for a female protagonist. Give them a male protagonist oh. and redu- reduce her role. So you don't play as her nearly as much. And then Odyssey and, and Valhalla is cool because you can choose either one, male or female, but I'm kind of like, give me a female character. Yeah, dude, I mean... Avali was awesome. It yeah. was so much fun playing with her, and I was just or playing as her. Sorry. <laughs> and it's a spinoff. It was a spinoff on a portable console. <laughs> Literally, it was it was really well done with how they did it. And there's shit. I mean, come on, it's 2020. Give us a woman character. Please. Seriously. Oh, I'm I'm playing as Cassandra in my Odyssey playthrough, and I will 100% play the female version of Ivor for that reason. I do think there needs to be more female representation in the Assassin's Creed series. <laughs> 100%. I mean. One could argue that females can sometimes be a lot more agile than males, and they can probably be sneakier, so you could probably do much cooler assassinations or just movement in general, and I, it's, that sounds like an awesome game to me. Like, don't That's... get me wrong. I will forever love Ezio Auditore di Forense, but come on. Bless me, Ubisoft. <laughs> give me something. Yeah, seriously, like, uh, give us a female that's as interesting as Ezio, and that would be amazing. Ezio. <laughs> Ezio. <laughs> but no, 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 for real. Facts, dude. Facts. Um, I, I really want to, I know this isn't really related, but I just want to set aside some time to say, like, I would really appreciate a female protagonist. And like you were saying, females are more agile and have a, a potential to be more stealthy or just, just going off of gen- general. Of course, Male and female. I mean, these are gender roles. There's not any kind of set in stone. But biologically speaking, as you know, generally and generally speaking, I mean, the women have a kind of a more of a predisposition towards that. And so that's why it would be really interesting to to be able to play as a woman. And I did like that aspect in Assassin's Creed Syndicate, for instance, where Evie was actually the more stealthy assassin. And I enjoyed playing as her more than Jacob, actually, who was kind of more of a brawler, which isn't really what Assassin's Creed is about. It's almost like it's forgotten that Assassin's Creed is about stealth, but... Yeah, and honestly, it would add kind of a level of empowerment to society. I mean, come on. If you take one of the most popular video game franchises and balance it out on the subject of gender roles, I mean, how awesome would that be? How how much of an impact would that have on not just the gaming community, but people in general hearing about this? Oh, we have this badass woman protagonist that's just slaying lives and taking them. I mean, come on. Slide love- my heart and rip it out, please. <laughs> <laughs> I love these games and I love the series, but man, fuck Ubisoft for some of the decisions that they made. Um, 100%. 100%. All right, well, let's, uh, mo- let's move into our number two. Okay, so my number two is going to be very brief because, Ash, we pretty much beat the absolute hell out of it earlier, but yeah. it's Origins. That, that was my number two on my list. Um, the Great Pyramids of Giza are absolutely phenomenal. And we don't have to rehash that. We'll go ahead and jump into your number two. But yeah, Origins is spectacular. It looks absolutely beautiful. Highly recommend you playing the game. Climb the Great Pyramid of Khufu and take a look at the world. Yeah. Uh, we, we, the, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. You're good. No. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, we touched on that earlier. But yeah, I definitely have to agree. It was on my list as well. So um, it, it should be no surprise that um, Origins is... It's in both of our top five lists. I mean, it, it, it was just absolutely incredible to be able to visit some of those locations. Um, but my penultimate choice um, is actually going to be uh, the Caribbean during the Golden Age of Piracy as featured in Black Flag. Mm. Um, and, and this is probably going to be a hot take for you, but <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of gamers are going to you know agree with me here. Um, but there was something that Assassin's Creed 4 did that was special, that Black Flag introduced the idea of... I mean, and, and like I said before, it's a great pirate game. It absolutely is. Um, and I feel like the series maybe did need to kind of step away from it 
itself for a little bit and kind of delve into this because there is nothing that quite um, beats the feeling of being able to just sail the Caribbean, hearing the sea shanties, you know, while you're, I mean, those are fire, man. They are fire. I will actually listen to them. I have the soundtrack on Apple Music, okay? Um, <laughs> the sea shanties. They should have been rated R. <laughs> R. Oh, no. The oldest dad joke in the book. Gotta throw it in the episode. <laughs> <laughs> naval combat was a part. We had naval missions in Assassin's Creed 3, but they were just missions. Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag actually took that, and we delve into this in our in our um, episode on it. So, you know, you'll hear more about this in, 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 in the episode if you go listen to that. But um, uh, Black Flag kind of took that and, and turned it into um, a central gameplay mechanic that you can just seamlessly move from um, different islands onto your ship and continue sailing around and and it's incredible it's breathtaking the map is huge by the way it's still one of the biggest maps in the series and like i said before i it did hold that honor for a long time and it's also one of the most historically i think it is like the most historically accurate or or, sorry geographically accurate setting um its general shape actually matches the, the shape of the islands in the caribbean including cuba and haiti um i love the fact that you can dive and, and do like the underwater shipwrecks. Um, I love um, going into Nassau and seeing the pirates. I love Havana, you know, just as this huge city and Kingston as well. Um, I mean, any fan of the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean series, I think may might agree with, you know, how, how awesome the setting it is and how cool it is to be a pirate. <laughs> I'm trying, to, I'm trying to pluck on my heartstrings there with Pirates of the Caribbean. I know. You know, I, I'm I'm going to be honest with you. I am considering buying this game and giving it another shot just because Assassin's Creed is such a good series. And I mean, I was a lot younger the first time I took a look at it. So maybe I need to put my childish crap aside and <laughs> give it another look because it is an Assassin's Creed story that I haven't gotten to experience. I don't even know the main character's name. Edward um, Kenway. He's the uh, father of Hatham from Assassin's Creed 3 and the grandfather of Connor. Nice. Oh, that's okay. All right. Yeah, I'm going to definitely need to pick this up. Um, I I hope GameStop has a copy, but you know what? I will say this on record with the podcast. I hate GameStop. <laughs> Forever and always will hate GameStop. You only have five PS5s available for pre-order. You uh, know what? I, I always just download everything digitally these days. Um, like obviously you can't do that with a console, but I, I've been going digital ever, especially during the pandemic. It's been nice to just, um, so many games recently I've just went and just bought. It's so easy. It's so, it's dangerously easy. Um, and if not that, you can also get some great, great deals on Amazon as well. If, if you want to get a physical disc for really cheap, um, okay. and you probably get things cheaper that way. I'll, to be honest with you, um, GameStop pricing used to be better than it is now. I will say that. Um, I, I GameStop have. used to be the shit back in the day, but then they stopped <laughs> offering you as much money for, and they started charging more for shit. So <laughs> yeah, I have, I have 20 games, three consoles, um, some cords and six controllers. All right. I'll give you five cents. I will say going back to the characters, which again, a little bit off topic, but you know, who, what, what, what kind of a podcast, what kind of a collateral gaming episode is it if we don't go on tangents here? <laughs> but, um, Edward Kenway is actually an interesting protagonist, and he is, in my opinion, almost as good as Ezio. I mean, on my ranked list, I, I, I would say um, it's hard to say because I'm not exactly sure where everything stands. But if, if if number two and Brotherhood were my favorite, um, then then uh, four or Black Flag would be a close second to that. But you know, even that, that's three games, and I'm not really sure where I'd put Origins and Odyssey because I love them, but they're so different. Um, more on that later, but Edward Kenway is actually a fantastic protagonist. Um, although I don't like how most of the game you're not an assassin. It is not until the very end that he even flies the assassin creed, uh, the assassin logo. Uh, it was like the assassin insignia with the Jolly Roger, and it's not until the very end that you actually Edward actually joins the assassin. So it's kind of weird, but he is an awesome character, and it is a fantastic setting. And if you want to hear more about it, um, just check out our episode. Um, all right. Well, we're down to it. Number one. I mean, this really should come as no surprise to anyone what we're about to choose, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, if we have the same one, which I believe we do. Uh, we do. It's it's definitely one of the top picks for anybody. If you don't choose this, you're wrong. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Venice, Assassin's Creed 2. 
Italy. Well, I'm going to say, yeah, Renaissance, Renaissance Italy, Italy as a whole is mine. Ugh. But Venice, I think, probably was the was the best um, well the best was the best city I think in Assassin's Creed Two. But I love Roma, uh, or Rome in, in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, dude, take the lead on this part because we both have probably so much to say about this. So go ahead, knock them dead. Okay. So yeah, again, we love the Italian Renaissance from Two and Brotherhood, um, and the reason for that, besides them just being fantastic games and having the best protagonist in the series and the best story, okay, let's just throw that out of the way real quick because we're just gonna focus on the setting, right? Is just how beautiful it is, right? So we went from kind of the drab, you know, um, dull colors and settings of Assassin's Creed 1, which at the time was phenomenal when it came out, but when you play it now, it's very boring, and when you compare it to Assassin's Creed 2, which just took the game to new levels, I mean, it, the, the difference is is just astounding, but I love how many different uh, landmarks and, and huge towering uh, buildings are there. The architecture is amazing. I love the Italian accents and then the people walking around, and it's just so very Italian, and you meet fucking Leonardo da Vinci. What?! Requiescat in pace. <laughs> Requiescat in pace. Yeah. I mean, God, it is It is just incredible. Um, it, Doesn't it, it's da Vinci just a breathtaking your... setting. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, you're good. Doesn't Da Vinci give you your second hidden blade? Yes, he does. In both uh, games. Oh, my God. Leonardo Da Vinci. Leonardo. The beautiful bastard. And, and bastardo. they're best friends. Remember? Yeah, bastardo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, like, uh, Ezio and, and, and uh, Leonardo are just longtime friends. And while Leonardo isn't officially an assassin, he's affiliated with the assassins and he's helped them out quite a bit. And I think he's very much in the know of everything that's going on. Um, but you also have famous historical figures. And we didn't really touch on this as much with the settings. Cause I like how in Assassin's Creed three, like you meet George Washington and you meet Benjamin Franklin. I think that's part of the setting In yeah. origins. You meet Cleopatra, right? And, and uh, unity, you meet Napoleon, but what's wonderful, um, are the characters you meet and that really make the Italian Renaissance setting. I mean, you, in addition to Leonardo da Vinci, you have Niccolo Machiavelli, um, Rodrigo Borgia, uh, Pope Alexander, who, you know, in a controversial move is actually the enemy and he's actually an atheist in the game. <laughs> Cesare Borgia and Lucrezia, and I believe the incest rumors uh, was that that's an actual thing. Oh God! <laughs> oh no! But yeah, you see, you see Pope Alexander rise into the role. You, you see uh, Rodrigo Borgia um, rise to the papacy, and and I thought that that was just incredible. Um, just ah, <laughs> man, I. You know, thinking about this game and just how long it's been since I've played it, I got to pick it up and do it again. But I mean. Uh, the setting in and of itself, it's it's not it's not just like how the game plays and the story and the characters you meet. It's just so gorgeous. I mean, they're yes. just clear blue gondola filled canals uh, upon the entire lagoon of which Venice is built upon. It's it's definitely the most colorful and vivid Italian city that Ezio, Ezio explores. I mean platforming across picturesque water escapes and it's just not escapes water escapes there you go <laughs> and i mean during the game like during the game's campaign the city plays host to the annual carnival and yes. it's just it's insane so there's so many masked and costumed performers across the city it just brings the game to life and i just i love it so much there's so much going on i mean not nearly as much as you know the streets of paris you know but I mean, come on. If Assassin's Creed 2 was my first Assassin's Creed game, and it's what made me fall in love with the series just because of how involved everything and everyone was and the combat system, it was just it was perfect. It was free it was flowing to me and I yes. loved it. And I think I I put so much time into the game. I think I played it like four times. <laughs> I Assassin's Creed 2 was one of the first that I think it was the first that I beat 100%. And I did everything there was to do in the game. Um, and I recently just beat Brotherhood for the first time. We'll get into that in a second here. But um, I, I love um, the the feeling of, of taking Roma back one district at a time as well, uh, removing the Templar influence. Again, this is a feature that's going to return in several Assassin's Creed games. We'll talk about that in a, more in a second, too. I'm trying to. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but um, Assassin's Creed 2 again, I think, has the best story in the series, hands down. 
I mean, you just really empathize. You you take this character, Ezio, who's just this lovable, womanizing guy, right? Um, <laughs> Opening kind scene. of a scoundrel, you know? <laughs> and, and then he's thrust into, um, in, into conspiracy and, and into... Um, betrayal and revenge and the entire story is this is this is the story of revenge with Ezio eventually abandoning that by the end um which i think probably came to bite him in the ass with rodrigo still being alive in brotherhood but yeah that's neither here nor there the the, the, the important part was just um how huge it was and then they also introduced you know as part of as far as the modern day storyline goes the whole involvement of the first civilization uh meeting juno who actually talks directly to desmond so Ezio and desmond actually kind of talk it's weird okay <laughs> but i'm not Ezio fighting and, it and we're not fighting it um so yeah, I mean, oh, it's just incredible. I love that moment in the carnival too, where you time the using the hidden gun with the the fireworks. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> Absolutely awesome. awesome. Honorable character mention, uh, Christina. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the best and most beautiful woman, and nothing like you know hooking up with her and then diving out the window into a bale of hay to get the game started. Hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent. But um. I guess we'll um, we'll go ahead and shift to our second portion here, um, yeah. right after a quick break. Yeah, right after a quick break, folks. Through the years, I have watched the city of Rome. I have studied, trained and killed within its walls. And in time, I have tamed it, shaped it. Nowhere in this city have I met a man equal to myself. A soul willing to kill in the name of destiny, capable enough to claim what is rightfully his, cunning enough to stare death in the eye, and charismatic enough to raise an unstoppable army to conquer all of Italia. What are you going to do? Make some friends. If I want to live, I live. If I want to take, I take. You are the leader of the assassins now. Unite them, Ezio Atori, and take back Roma. If I ever did meet such a man, if that man entered my city, I know exactly how I would welcome him. All right, we are back, folks. Um, we're going to go ahead and talk about Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Um, I think one of the more phenomenal entries in the franchise, for sure. Absolutely, freaking lootly dude. Yeah. In a surprising it's move, the, oh. not taking a new setting and character like Assassin's Creed 2 did, but just expanding on it. And I think that was for the best because everybody just was so attached to Ezio and the Italian Renaissance setting. I mean, like we talked about before we started this, I mean, Ezio is one of the, still to me to this day, one of the most beloved characters in the series. He has three separate games where you follow his story and you watch his character development, which, by the way, in Brotherhood, I'm sure we'll talk more about this, is phenomenal. Ezio's character development is spectacular. He's in his prime as an assassin. He's got experience under his belt, and he is just ready to remove the world of Templars. And it's it's spectacular. So oh, take it yeah, away, my brother. It it picks up right after Assassin's Creed 2. And I mean right after. Okay. 1499 is the year, right? I think so. I can't quite yeah. remember the years. But yeah, it's right there in the vault. 
Ezio has just talked to Juno. He's just spared uh, Pope Alexander. Um, and then um, we kind of move our way out with him and Mario um, <laughs> moving out of out of Rome, which Rome is the final city in Assassin's Creed 2, but you don't actually you just explore one part of it and you can't I don't think you can return to it. It's just that mission. Um, but they kind of run out of there. They head back to uh, Monte Regioni and then uh, which is the the modern day setting uh, of the game. And then they never return Monte Regioni. There's a real there was a real siege of Monte Regioni, by the way, around that time, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and then Ezio takes it back to Rome and kind of the whole idea is taking Rome back from the Templars. So yep. Ezio is basically um, he's finding new recruits for the assassin order and he's slowly buying out all of the shops and, and taking down the, the Borgia towers to basically, um, well, like we said before, taking the, the, the city back one district at a time. And that's a new gameplay mechanic that was added. Yep, it's it's another another Breath of the Wild reference. I, I I loved the inclusion of the Borgia controlled towers that you took down one at a time, kind of expanding your view on the areas. And let me just say that the Borgia family in Rome in the time of the early Italian wars, they did not play no. at all. They were not happy with the involvement of Ezio. And even though at first they weren't completely and totally aware of it, he made himself <laughs> known very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were assholes, I think, in real life, too. Oh, you know? I don't doubt it. <laughs> not, not to speak ill of an actual historical pope, but... <laughs> I mean, we, we've, we've... we've You know, not to offend our Catholic viewers, but, I mean, we, we've got several um, evidences of popes being, you know, less than, less than popes. People poping around. I mean, shit. I mean, they were selling, like, indulgences and shit. I mean, that's, that's, that's fucked up. But we're not going to talk about religion. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy oh boy okay <laughs> um i love a lot of the new uh gameplay mechanics that are here to stay as well i mean we've introduced chain assassination something that i think was sorely missing from the series beforehand right mm -hmm. and brotherhood was the first one to do it right yeah Where... it's like when you didn't take damage or you didn't miss um you could chain kills back to back to back and you didn't stop and Honestly, there was one point in the game, I think I was at the third or fourth tower, where I killed one assassin, or killed one assassin, oops. I killed, um, I killed a guard, and I missed the second guard, but then I successfully killed him, and then I chain-killed everybody else. Yeah. And it was amazing. I recorded it, and it was spectacular. <laughs> there was something about the early Assassin's Creed titles where combat was easy. But it didn't feel stupidly easy. Like in three and four, there was still a little bit of strategy to it. You had to get the timing just right on the counter kills. And depending on what weapon you had selected, they were easier or harder. I yeah. remember using the hidden blade was a better effect, but it was really difficult to get the timing just right. You were better to opt off, opt with the sword, or if you're fighting an enemy with a dagger, use a dagger yourself. You know? Yeah, I mean they did it right. I mean you're a skilled assassin, but you actually have to time it and you have to learn it right. And, and it wasn't. No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it was it wasn't painfully easy, but once you got the hang of it, you're basically putting yourself in Ezio's shoes and you know how the mechanics work and you know how to make it a smoother transition between kills or when you're fighting or just completing a basic level mission. Once you smooth out those controls, it makes it so much easier to keep going. It doesn't necessarily make the game easier. It just means you've gotten better at it. Yeah, I, I will say two and Brotherhood do feel a little bit more dated. Uh, it does show in some of the character models and even in the you know remastered version and some of the mechanics aren't just quite as precise as you want them to be when you're parkouring. But God, does it still hold up? It really does. Mm -hmm. You know, but barring a few, you know, minor minor things. I mean, it, it really does. The gameplay is phenomenal. It is um, just a complete hop and a skip away. No, sorry, it's the opposite of a hop and a skip. It's it just, just, just a bridge between the first <laughs> Assassin's Creed game and the second. But we're here to talk about Brotherhood, which takes almost everything that we love about 2 um, and just builds on it. I like how you've also got the, all of the secondary weapons that are kind of attached. So when you're playing... Um, when, when you're using the sword, you actually have the pistol or hidden gun that's used for some of your flourishes. And it took me a while to figure out that you can actually, while you're chain killing, you can hold down the weapon button, square in our case, to, to pull off the uh, hidden gun assassinations at any time, which is nice. When you're holding the dagger, the same thing with, uh, with, with throwing knives. Yeah. 
Uh, it was really interesting to be able to see how many different creative ways you could chain kill. And <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> there were some points during those sequences where the animation kind of messed up a little bit. <laughs> and you could send guards flying. And it was it was spectacular. But it doesn't it doesn't fall short of amazing just playing. <laughs> No, it is incredible, and I love um, I, I love the feeling of, of, of chain killing people. I mean, oh just going god. you can just be a god. You just you just keep going, and as soon as an enemy attacks you, just counter kill again, and then just rinse and repeat. Keep going, keep going. You can keep these chains up forever and ever and ever. You know what I also liked about Brotherhood that didn't make its way into the other games? What's up? The Animus virtual training. Oh, oh, dude, yes, it was spectacular. I mean, it also makes sense because. Um, in the story, like while you're playing as Ezio working with the local brotherhood to restore its name to the former glory. I mean, back in 2012, Desmond and the other assassins are continuing their search for the apple of Eden that Ezio left behind. And so it comes to tie those two things directly together simply because there's a clash of timelines. And so being able to interact with the animus more just made sense, you know? Yeah. I also like how and the one feature that was missing from Assassin's Creed 2 that did make its way into Brotherhood was the ability to leave the Animus at any time, um, which was all for the best, I think, when Assassin's Creed 2 came out, because the modern day sections were fucking boring as hell in the first Assassin's Creed. <laughs> they may as well not have even been there. I, I keep speaking ill of the first game. It's a great game. It's just very repetitive, and it's just so much not as good as the other games when you would to the games that came afterward. I know, <laughs> Fillers in Naruto. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good analogy. I'm sorry. No, you're good. Um, fuck, dude. I don't. I lost my train of thought. But no. Okay, so you can leave, and you can actually enter modern day Monte Rajoni. Um, which is actually really cool because you have basically the same familiar map from from Assassin's Creed 2, uh, Monte Rajoni, but it's in the modern day. You've got cars and shit. Um, and there's even, I think, some secondary uh, bullshit that you can do that's not pertinent to the main story, but there's like things you could find. <laughs> and there's that weird red trail that was never explained. Was that like foreshadowing for Lucy or? Uh, maybe. I'm not sure. I haven't. I... You know what? That's a. Wow, that's a perplexing thought. <laughs> We won't get into it because I I, I kind of want to stay away from spoilers on the mini reviews. But um, I, you, do you do you see what I mean? I feel like that was probably I what do, that 100%. was. And oh my god, now okay, we're gonna have to dive into this at some point. You and I both turn on the game and just like okay, let's let's figure this out. Yeah. By the way, the ending of this game is just a complete shock. I love the way that it ends. Um, and then they just um, anim you know, needless to say, Desmond is thrown back into the animus, and and you you're there to stay after the end. But <laughs> um, I like the uh, I like the fact that the modern day section they did a good job with it. It's actually completely optional, and the game never does interrupt at any point, does it? I mean, I just played through it, and I can't think of a single time that the main story was interrupted for a modern day section. So. No, uh, not not once. Um, it was a very, very. It was honestly, in my opinion. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Assassin's Creed too, but Brotherhood was one of the more free flowing games where you could just keep moving without fear of interruptions. Now there was a lot of story content, but you could focus on what you wanted to focus on at any given point and not, like you know, be interrupted by some modern day bullshit. Yeah, and it was the first game to feature like a really like I think Assassin's Creed had two had some DLC, but this is the first one to have like a full on like DLC expansion with the Da Vinci disappearance yep. sequence. Um, and I love how much there is to do in terms of side questing. Like um, Black Flag, this game really excels when it comes to the side quest content. Some of which is just as good, if not better, than, than some of the main story content. Mm -hmm. um, I love, like we said before, I love taking back each district one at a time and, and, and taking down the Templars. Um, and you also get to buy out all of the shops in the area and make income from that. It's the first yep. game, I think, to do that, which, where you have a recurring income that you go and collect from the bank. Oh, um, dude, yes. You can't tell me that's not Ubisoft trying to teach kids how to be smart with their money and make investments. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the, the brother, the assassin recruits fantastic addition and, and another gameplay aspect that m managed to stay in a lot of the games afterwards um where you could just call in assassins to come in and fuck shit up yep absolutely spectacular they, and they, they did, really yeah. helped it wasn't just yeah. like a random ability where it kind of helps no they really came in and put work in it was great 
and you could recruit them and send them off on missions, um, a lot like the naval campaign and, and Black Flag, where they would just kind of do their own thing, and then after a while, they'd be back. Um, unlike Black Flag, though, the assassin recruits here are useful. You can call them, you know, to... Uh, do shit for you to go assassinate someone for you here real low key you know are you on a mission where the optional objective is do not be detected or the main objective is mm -hmm. fuck yeah just throw in an assassin to go assassinate you know if you got caught by the guard real quick done um you know you throw the arrow storm to just kill all the enemies on screen badass yeah this is this was one of those spectacular additions to the game where i just felt like i wasn't really going to get stuck you could really, if you recruited enough assassins, you could really rely on them to get you out of a crappy situation. And I loved that. And of course, it was more difficult at first because you don't have as many allies. But the Arrow Storm, now that you mention it, was one of the coolest aspects yeah. about those recruits because the towers, of course, like any other game, the towers just get harder and harder to overcome. But one of the last towers in the game I actually finished because of an Arrow Storm. And I didn't think about that until like my eighth or ninth attempt to take the tower. Yes, I'm bad. You don't have to tell me, viewers. I appreciate it. But the Aerostorm saved my life and actually won me the tower. It was fantastic. Nice. The assassin groups also can die in combat, which is kind of a touching moment where Ezio goes and he pays respect to them real quick. I remember that. Um, the first time it happened, I couldn't find my dude. I was like, I'm sorry. I want to pay respects, but I can't find you. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I had just... <laughs> he was a green. He was a green. He was green behind the ears. I mean, he was he was a new assassin recruit, and he died because <laughs> I sent him out too early because it doesn't really let you pick who you're gonna send out. So I sent out this like level one or level level two dude. He at most he would have been like level three, uh, and and he was just murdered. And I didn't realize it until it was too late. And then and then the next assassin to die was his replacement that also <laughs> died too soon. <laughs> <laughs> don't take this position it's very dangerous for you because <laughs> they were the only ones that were like way behind everyone else's level <laughs> so yep. I was like fuck quit tying this position is cursed <laughs> yeah I'm not replacing it this one's just going to be empty you guys got this you guys are fine you're fine it's okay <laughs> <laughs> no for real like facts bro um, what else was I going to say about this I had another point in mind um, I will say some of the main story missions, uh, the level design does need a little bit of tweaking. I think the game was developed a little quickly, um, which is one of the only issues with Assassin's Creed games is that they do tend to be a little bit buggy and glitchy because they release them so quickly. I, I just wish they had spent more time on each game um, rather than going for yearly or, or bi-yearly releases. But but there, it's very few and far between, but some of the story missions are kind of really frustrating. And for me, I was insistent on doing the optional objectives. For me, yeah. that's a big part of the experience because I have to play it the way that Ezio did and feel like a badass. If the game says don't get detected. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. But Brotherhood doesn't offer a checkpoint option that came in other games. So you had to restart the whole fucking memory if you messed up. And no, you couldn't m d kill yourself. You had to restart the entire fucking memory if you mess up the optional objective. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't... No, no, you're right. That that sucked. <laughs> I was gonna try to defend it a little bit, but I can't. That was that was awful. You know, I like it's like playing uh, the game on permadeath. Yeah. But not as bad because could you imagine playing an Assassin's Creed game on permadeath mode? You yeah. Start the entire. It's like I started The Last of Us two again, um, and I put it on permadeath, and I died literally at the beginning of the game, and I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not doing this. Yeah. Because <laughs> you have to watch the whole opening sequence again. Yeah, and. and the checkpoints do work when you die, but if you fail the the optional objective, you're fucked. You have to restart the memory. It doesn't it doesn't count. So yep. that was that was the only aspect for me. I did like the inclusion though, because there are ways that you know make you feel more badass. If it's like don't lose any health, I'm like fuck it. I'm gonna chain kill these bastards. I remember that one. that early mission um, before the the Romulus missions. Oh, another inclusion that I thought was awesome is I love. Um, and, and this was a staple to come throughout was the um, the Romulus missions because um, they're like these parkour segments. Yeah. Um, and, and it's basically just parkour puzzle. And, and that was really great. And some of them are timed, which is kind of frustrating. But um, despite the fact that they also include chests in the game, I'm not sure what to, to make of that. Because, you know, am I supposed to rush through this to get the objective? Or am I supposed to collect all the chests along the way? Can I come here later and get the chests? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing we really didn't talk about is, you know, why Ezio is doing all of this. 
Mm-hmm. Um, because, I mean, you defeat Rodrigo Borgia and you obtain the Apple of Eden at the end of the previous game, right? Right. Ezio returns, Ezio, Ezio returns to Monteriggioni and he's planning on retiring from the assassin lifestyle. He wants to be done. But then Cesar Borgia shows up and against his father's orders and attacks Monteriggioni. He takes back the Apple and he kills Mario. Like, yeah, that, that, at that, I was very, very hurt at that and i felt for Ezio, and i had no i had no gosh i can't even i can't english i'm so sorry <laughs> i had nothing against Ezio coming back and wanting to just tear shit up and i mean of course you know the tide turns against the templars more towards the end of the game and rodrigo calls out cesar for unnecessarily pissing off Ezio, and <laughs> when they could have easily taken over italy without the apple i mean it would have been awesome but you know impractical <laughs> do you remember the, the a- Apple of Eden segments? Those were kind of badass at first, but then once they realized you couldn't use any of your weapons and it drained your health, it wasn't as fun. But <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. But the Apple I of mean, Eden segments were cool. It's it's really cool. They It, it kind of felt like, uh, God, I'm going to make so many Zelda references today. It felt kind of like, um, what were they? Uh, trials from Skyward Sword. Oh, yeah, the Silent Trails? In the Silent Realms, there you go. Yeah, it it felt like that because you just had to rely on your skill as a human, like and your ability to move and run and free run and climb and yeet, <laughs> yeet, <laughs> yeet being the word for the day. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Man, Brotherhood is such a spectacular game, dude. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I love oh. the feeling of taking, um, taking Rome back one, you know. One Templar at a time, and I love the feeling of recruiting assassins. And then Ezio becomes the mentor of the assassins in the game. Iconic. You know, he thought he was going to retire because he basically completed his personal mission, only to find out that he had a bigger role to play. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he remained an assassin till the end of his life, you know? I think he did retire but at some point. but Oh, man, once an assassin, always an assassin. You're a part of the Brotherhood. Yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely spectacular. I'm trying to pull something up here really okay. quick. I think I have, I may not be able to find it. And if that's the case, then I'm probably just wasting time, but that's all right because it's all about the effort that counts. Right. Right. <laughs> but, um, if you had to, if you had to pick, uh, what is your most memorable moment from the game? Like just playing it a funny death you had, or what, what would you have to say? Hmm. I'm trying to think. Um, I don't know. I just, I just like so much of it. Um, oh, you know what else I didn't, we didn't touch on was the, the Da Vinci machine missions. Those were cool. Oh, those were really cool. Yeah. Yeah. The Divi- though. A little bit more parkour puzzles in there. And then also, you know, getting to control the machine and, and yeah. uh, there's a fucking tank. What? I mean, well, mind blown. I mean, can you honestly say you're surprised? <laughs> there's a machine get- gun. <laughs> It can only get more badass from there. And I think those were all like real designs that that, that Da Vinci had designed. I mean, he was a man ahead of his time. Um, Dude, can you imagine if there were just tanks in that that time period? You you know what was the most memorable moment for me? When Ezio is crowned mentor. Iconic. Are you you serious? Yeah, I gotta say. That's mine! That was yours? Okay. No way, dude. Are you kidding (laughs) It's such a memorable moment. It's awesome, you know. And 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 then um, it's kind of where where Machiavelli kind of steps down and says, "No, like you're you're the dude that's been doing all this work. Like I'm I'm not the man in charge here." You're and then putting all the effort in, yeah, yeah. And then despite them being at odds, you know, um, Ed says, "Like, well, you're my most trusted advisor, so you know, tell me tell me what your advice is." And he, I thought that was great. Um, and Ezio always defended him. Even though they were at odds, you know, Ezio knew that Machiavelli was 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 a was a real guy, was a real dog. I mean, the thing is, what I was talking about with Ezio's character development, like at the beginning, he seems kind of like this, you know, bad boy that doesn't really give a shit. And throughout the entirety of his uh, time in Assassin's Creed II, Brotherhood and Revelations, he becomes more humble, more skilled, more compassionate and he shows more and more respect to the people that he takes out because he takes the brother, the assassin's creed to heart. You know, he, he knows that what he's doing is for the betterment of the world. And 
I, they do a really good job with showing his growth. And I absolutely adore that. You know, that's another reason why I love him out of any of the characters more than anybody, you know? Yeah. And you wouldn't think there would be that much more development to do because Assassin's Creed 2 takes place over like 20 years. And Ezio really develops in that game as well. But he's still got some more work to do. In fact, I think they keep hinting that he's kind of an old man and, and brotherhood. <laughs> Yeah. Did you know, and I didn't know this either, but Brotherhood and Revelations are only like two years apart. And Ezio looks so much different in Revelations. It's weird. He looks like an old man. He does. <laughs> Here's what I think, though. And I, and I think they did this intentionally because Altair looks different, too. In Assassin's Creed 1 through Brotherhood, the Animus shows all uh, Ezio's and Altair's face is as Desmond's face. So that wasn't their actual face. That was Desmond's. And we kind of just assume, well, maybe it's because it's his, it's their an, it's his ancestor. But no, that's the animus like imprinting his face onto them. So Revelations Ezio actually was what Ezio was was actually what Ezio looked like. Um, of course, his beard was all grown out and shit, so he did look quite a bit older. But dude, he looked like, I mean, if it's just a two years difference, he looked like in those two years that we didn't get to experience, he had been through some shit. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. <laughs> I mean, he grew his beard out and shit and got gray, but um, they make a few references to him being kind of getting older and, and, and brotherhood already. But but yeah, what a fantastic way to continue the legacy of Ezio. Um, I, I enjoy that. You know, he's the only game, the only character that actually has his own trilogy because he deserves it. Um, yep. But I, I guess we'll sort of wrap it up from here. Um, any, any, any final thoughts? Um. No, Brotherhood uh, and 2 will always be my favorite Assassin's Creed games, not just because of Ezio, um, just with how they played and the memories that I have with them, the amount of time I spent playing with them. Assassin's Creed is a phenomenal franchise. I highly suggest playing all of them. Ignore me saying that because I haven't played Black Flag, but I will, <laughs> <laughs> I will definitely give that a shot. Do you mind if I do a small shout out? Go for it. I am going to shout out my boys, Jay and McLovin. I met them on Call of Duty, but they are huge fans of the franchise, and they're just overall great guys. Um, they're not podcasters. Um, I think they're athletes, but they're good dudes, and they have um, recruited like 50 or 60 people that are interested in our podcast, and it's really nice, and I'm thankful for them. That was uh, a surprise I wanted to share with Ash. We might have several, several more people wanting to hear our video game wisdom. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, Jay definitely. McLovin, shout out to you guys. You guys are lit. And I look forward to sniping more kids on Modern Warfare with you at any point in time. Unless you guys are just bad and you don't want to play anymore. But <laughs> yeah, that's all I got for you, man. Hey, thanks for listening, guys. Um, hey, if it, uh, and if anyone is listening, does enjoy this podcast or any of our others, please go leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Let us know what you think. Hit us up in the DMs on our and, social media. And we tell are your on, friends. Tell your friends. Share this podcast with your friends. Let them know um, what is the, the best video game podcast you've ever heard. Um, Unless it's not us, then then don't don't tell your friends. Tell your friends. <laughs> this um, is the only one that matters. The only one that matters. Exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, tell your friends. Share it. Um, hit, re you reach out to us on social media. We are on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, feel free to reach out to my personal uh, information as well. Ashley Allen Chancellor. I'm on all of the above. Um, also, check out our Patreon. We're coming out with some more exclusive Let's Plays. Um, as far as episodes go, w I should be getting out our collab with Perfect Paradox soon. It's just It was a two-hour podcast, so there's a lot to edit, but um, that should be done soon. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get that out. Um, we're going to get part two of our Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag out. Part one is out as of the time of this recording. Um, and then next season... We are starting off with The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. I'm super stoked. Bro, me too. I bought it on my Wii U Fuck virtual yeah. console. And I don't know if you can do the three-day challenge. I'm definitely not talented enough to do the three-day challenge. But you can. I'm going to try and do the three-day challenge. It's you not can't do happen. it on. You can't do it on the 3DS remake because they, they changed how much the inverted song of time. Um, it's actually faster. It, it only does half time instead of third time in the th 3DS remake. But in the original Nintendo 64 version, which is the version on the virtual console, you absolutely can still do the three-day challenge. And I'm so close. I, I've memorized, I think, a lot of the, the quickest routes through each of the dungeons. So I think I'm ready to try it. 
I just got to get my Wii U back, and then I'll um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a go. Yeah, when when you and I finally get to hang out in person, Ash, I'll, if you don't have it at that point, I will bring the Wii U over, and I will watch as you do this three day challenge. Okay, I, maybe we should do um, maybe that's what we should do our let's play on. I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of in between on whether I want to do a let's play on like the full game, like 100 percent, or if we should do a let's play on just the you know what we should do we'll do our let's play on the full game include all the side quests because it's 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 there's just so much that you know andrew can fay and all the best moments of the game are are in the hundred percent playthrough but um what we'll do is i'll probably do like a twitch stream where we try to do the three-day challenge we'll do it as like a stream and that'll probably be free it's not patron content we'll we'll, we'll let everybody watch our our let's play out our, our uh yeah our three-day challenge attempt Sounds like a plan, my dude. That's gonna be awesome. I, you definitely got to call me up when you do that stream. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna have to do it. So yeah, I, I in addition to to doing the game, I think I will I will probably go ahead and try to stream it while I'm doing the three day challenge. I just need to get a chat link. Um, anyway, we've rambled on long enough. Um, anything else to say? Any any closing messages for our viewers, uh, listeners? So to those of you who are listening, thank you very much. Um, it's been an absolute blessing to be able to hang out and chill with Ash and talk about this kind of stuff. I'm not going anywhere, I promise. But um, just thank you for everything. And uh, play Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Hell yeah. Play, play the game. It's amazing. I cannot wait to do Majora's Mask with this man. It is going to be spectacular. I know that's the wrong word, but it's okay. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but that that's it for me. Um, I appreciate all of you. And yeah, Ash, I'm a, like a news weather state or a weather station, news station, whatever the fuck you call it. Back to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, ditto what Zach said. I really don't have a lot more to add to that. Um, stay tuned for season three of Collateral Gaming, and we'll see you guys later. And that being said, I'm Ashley Chancellor. I'm Zachary Gio. This is Collateral Gaming, and we are out. Collateral Gaming is an L Company production. All music and game clips are owned by their respective creators and are used for educational purposes only. Please don't sue us. We're poor. <laughs>